In this video, we're going to take a look at exam revision for algebraic methods. So what we're going to do here is just take a look at some exam style questions for algebraic methods. And in particular here, we're going to focus on proof by contradiction and partial fractions. So this is quite a small chapter, so I'm only focusing really on these two parts of this chapter. I've got two questions here for proof by contradiction and then two different partial fraction questions. Okay. So as always, pause the video, have a look at the questions they appear and double check that your solution matches what we get on the screen. But other than that, I think that's everything that we need here to get started. So let's begin now with question one. So for question one here, we want to prove by contradiction that if n squared is even, then n is also even. Now this is a proof by contradiction. So to begin with here, we're going to give our opening assumption. So here, I'm going to assume there exists a number, let's say n, such that n squared is even, but n is odd. Okay, so let's just write that down to begin with. So assume there exists, assume there exists a number n, such that n squared is even, okay, like the question states here, So n squared is even, but n is odd, okay? So notice this is different here because for the original statement, we're saying that if n squared is even, then n is also even. Whereas here now for our opening assumption, we're saying there exists a number n such that n squared is even, but n is odd, okay? And if n is odd, so if n is odd, and what that means then is we can express it here in the form. Um, let me do this underneath. So n would be equal to say 2n plus 1, where m belongs to the integers. Okay. So m belongs to the integers here. Now, it doesn't matter here that I've used M, you can use any letter. Another typical letter to use here is K. do not really matter, I just prefer to use M. So, like we said then, N is odd, so I can express it in this form here. So, let's consider then what we get for N squared. Okay, so if N is odd, what do we get for N squared? Would that be even, or will that be odd? So, in that case then, for N squared, I'm going to get 2N plus 1 all squared, because N equals 2N plus 1. We get 2m plus 1 all squared. So if you were to expand these double brackets, I'd get 2m times 2m, so that would be 4m squared. We'd then have 2m times 1, and we'd repeat that again, so it'd be 1 times 2m. So I'm going to get two lots of 2m, so that's 4m. So I get 4m squared plus 4m. And then finally, 1 times 1, so that's equal to 1. Okay. So how do we identify here whether this is odd or even? Well, if we just look at this here for a moment, what I notice then is I can factor out a 2 here from the 4m squared and the 4m. So we can write this here then as 2 lots of 2m squared plus 2m. And then we've got the 1 here at the very end. Now this part here, because this is a multiple of 2, this must be even. So if we add 1 to this then, then my result here will be odd, okay? So what this shows then, so we say then that this shows that n squared must be odd. So this shows n squared is odd. And then this contradicts our assumption that n squared is even, okay? So this shows n squared is odd. And this contradicts our assumption n squared is even. Right, let me do it underneath, that n squared is even. So in that case then, if n squared is even, then n must also be even. So in other words, it just proves this um, original statement here. So therefore, 
if n squared is even. If n squared is even, then n then n is also even. Okay. And there we have it. So like you can see, just a standard proof by contradiction there. So opening assumption, um, bit of mathematical work here and deduction, and then we arrive at our contradiction there. Okay. But there we have it. So like is the solution there to question one. Moving on to question two now, where we have a question here on partial fractions. So what we've been given is this algebraic fraction here. So I've got 5x plus 1 over x plus 2 times x minus 1. What we want to do then is split that up into partial fractions. And we're going to find the value of the constants a and b. So the first thing that we're going to do here then is get the right-hand side over a common denominator. I'm going to get a lots of x minus 1. So a lots of x minus 1 plus b lots of x plus 2. Okay, that would all be over x plus 2 times x minus 1. We get x plus 2 times x minus 1 there. Now, if we now have the right hand side over a common denominator, what that means then is my numerators here must be identical. So in that case, then we have a lots of x minus 1. Plus b lots of x plus 2. And that is identical then to 5x plus 1. Okay. So now what we're going to do is use substitution here. So we want to eliminate one of these constants here. Okay. So for example, if I let x equal say 1, and what will happen is we'll eliminate a here because 1 minus 1 is 0, so a times 0, that would just give us 0. And then we can go on to solve for b here. Okay, so I'm going to get b lots of 1 plus 2, so that's 3b. We get 3b there is equal then. So now substituting x equals 1 into the right hand side here, we get 5 times 1, which is 5, plus the 1 giving us 6. And then we can solve for b here, so therefore b equals. 2. Okay, so that's the value of b. We now need to do the same here to find the value of a. So in this case here then, if we let x equal in this case then, what value would I have to substitute in to eliminate b? That would be x equals minus 2. Okay, so in other words, you just need to make this bracket here 0. So minus 2 plus 2 is 0. So we now eliminate b here, and then we can go on to solve for a. So I'm going to get minus 2 minus 1. So that's going to be minus 3. So I get minus 3a. We'll x equal minus 2. We get minus 3a. And that is equal then. So now substituting x equals minus 2 here into the right hand side. 5 times minus 2 is minus 10 plus the 1. And that gives us minus 9 there. And then we can solve for a here by dividing both sides by minus 3. So therefore, a equals 3. Okay, and then all we want to do then is just rewrite this here, and now we're going to substitute the values of a and b in. So in that case then, so therefore, 5x plus 1 all over x plus 2 times x minus 1. That is identical then to a over x plus 2, where a equals 3. So we get 3 over x plus 2, and then we've got plus b over x minus 1, where b is 2, so plus 2 over, we get 2 over x minus 1 there, okay? And in that case then, the value of a is 3, and the value of b is 2, okay? And there we have it, so that gives the solution there to question 2. Moving on to question three now, where we have another proof by contradiction question here. And for this question, we want to prove by contradiction that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So with this being another proof by contradiction here, we're going to start by assuming the opposite. So here in this case, if we want to prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers, I'm going to start by assuming that there is a finite number of primes. Let's just jot that down to begin with. So assume 
there is a finite number. So a finite number of primes. Okay. So that's our opening assumption here. Okay, so we're going to assume there is a finite number of primes. Now, if we have a finite number of primes, then what we should be able to do is list all of those prime numbers. Okay. So what we can do here then is list the finite number of primes. So we can list the finite number of primes. Okay. Now, if I call my first prime number here, say P1, my next prime number would be P2. We can keep going until we get to the very last prime number, which we don't know what it is. We call that our nth prime number, so I'm going to represent that as Pn. Okay, so we've got P1. We then have P2, P3. And we keep going here then. So we get to the last prime number here, which we don't know what it is, but we're going to call it Pn. So that's our nth prime number. So we've got Pn there. Now what we're going to do here is consider a number. Okay. It's up to you what you call this number. I'm going to call it Y, but you could call it X. Um, K, whatever, it don't really matter. Like I said, I'm going to call it Y. So Y is equal then to the product of all of these primes here, our finite list of primes, so it's the product of all of those, and then we add 1. Okay, so I've got P1 times P2 times P3, and we keep going here up to the very last prime number, so that's Pn. And then we add one. Okay. Now it might seem a little random that we add the one here, but there's actually a very genius reason behind why we add one here. Okay. So what I can say then is that y cannot be divisible by p1, p2, p3, or any of the other prime factors here up to my last prime number here, pn, because it will always have a remainder of one because of this reason here, the fact that we added one. Okay. So here, y cannot be divisible it says cannot be divisible by p1, p2, p3, all the way up to our last prime number here, pn, as we will always have a remainder of 1. as we will always have a remainder of 1. We will always have a remainder of 1. And like I said, that happens because we add this 1 on here. Okay. So what happens here then is this leads to one of two situations. So in this case, why is either prime or it would be divisible by a prime not on the list. Okay, so we get two scenarios then. So the first scenario here is that y is a new prime number that's not in my list. Okay, so y is a prime number not in the list. y is a prime number not in my list. which would obviously be an issue that would contradict here our list then, our finite number of primes. So why is a prime number not in my list? Or it's divisible by a prime not on the list. Okay. Or why is divisible by a prime number not on my list. Not in my list. Okay. Now, either way, no matter which of these two situations we arrive at, it forms a contradiction. Okay. So, therefore, what we can say then is both situations, so both situations lead to a contradiction.
So both situations lead to a contradiction in our assumption. And therefore then, it proves that there must be infinitely many prime numbers, okay, by contradiction. So therefore, there are, there are infinitely many prime numbers. There are infinitely many prime numbers by contradiction. Okay. And there we have it. So like you can see for that proof, there is quite a lot of writing involved. Um, but hopefully that seems quite intuitive as to why that happens. So all we've done then is assume there's a finite number of primes. Listed all those prime numbers. We've got a number here, y, which is equal to the product of all of those primes plus one. And then it leads to this situation here. Okay. And there we have it. So that gives the solution there to question three. And finally, then, if we take a look now at the very last question here, question four, where we have another question on partial fractions. And for this question here, what we want to do is take this fraction and split it up into partial fractions like we can see here and find the value of the constants A, B, and C. Now, just notice for this question as well, we actually have a repeated factor here. So I've got x minus 1 squared. So we have a repeated factor. It makes things a little bit more complicated, but nothing too challenging. So we start in the usual way here of getting a common denominator on the right hand side. So getting a common denominator, what I do then is I times a by x minus 1 and x plus 2. So that would give me my common denominator here of x minus 1 squared times x plus 2. So like we said, then we get a lots. So I get a lots of x minus 1. And then we times that by x plus 2. Okay. Doing the same here then for b, we're now going to times b here by x plus 2 because it's already over x minus 1 squared. So we get b lots of x plus 2. And then finally for c here, we're going to times c by x minus 1 squared because that's already over x plus 2. So we get c lots of x minus 1 squared. Okay. And this here is all over our common denominator now, which is x minus 1 squared times x plus 2. We've got x minus 1 squared times x plus 2 there. Okay. So what we do now is we set the numerators here to be identical. So in that case then, I'm going to get a lots of x minus 1, x plus 2, plus b lots of x plus 2, plus c lots of x minus 1 squared, being identical then to this quadratic here. Let me just write that down to begin with. So I've got a lots of x minus 1, x plus 2. We've then got b lots of x plus 2. And then finally, c lots of x minus 1 squared. And that is identical then to this quadratic here of 8x squared minus 9x minus 5. So 8x squared minus 9x minus 5. Okay. So what we're going to do now is use substitution here to eliminate two of the constants and then solve for the remaining constant. So to begin with, if I let x equal 1 here, for example, let me do it over here. If I let x equal 1, then what would we get? Well, I'm going to get 1 minus 1 here, so that would be 0. So this a here, this constant a, would disappear. The same is true then for the constant c, because 1 minus 1, that would be 0. 0 squared is 0, so c disappears. So now we can solve for b here. So I've got 1 plus 2, which is 3, so I get 3b. I get 3b here is equal then. So I've got 8 lots of 1 squared, so that's 8. So I get 8 minus 9 times 1, so that's minus 9. And then minus 5 here. So altogether, that gives me minus 6 there on the right-hand side. So 3b is equal to minus 6. And then finally, dividing both sides by 3. 
we get that b equals minus 2 there. Okay, so that's the value of the constant there, b. So now let's use another substitution here. So now let's, well, let's put x, or choose x to be, so what value can I choose here? So for example, if I let x equal minus 2, okay, and what would happen is this bracket here would be 0, minus 2 plus 2 is 0. So this whole term here would be 0, so a would disappear. And the same is true here for b, because minus 2 plus 2 again is 0, so b times 0 is 0. What we can do then is solve for c. So I've got minus 2 minus 1, that's minus 3. We square that, so here I'm going to get 9c. So we get 9c, and that is equal then to 8 lots of minus 2 squared. So minus 2 squared is 4, so 8 times 4 is 32. So we get 32 there. Minus 9 times minus 2 there, so that's positive 18. Okay, and then minus the 5 there. What would that give me? 32 plus 18 is 50. Minus the 5 gives me 45. So 9c is equal to 45. So therefore, if we solve for c, we get that c equals 5. Okay. Now, the issue here for my last constants, so we found b, we found c, but the issue here is there's no more substitutions now in a way that I can eliminate b and c here and then solve for a, okay? So to find the value of the constant a here, we now need to equate coefficients for x squared. So to solve for a, so to solve for a, we will equate coefficients. Okay, so let's just make a note of that here. So if I do that for coefficients for x squared, okay, let's make a note of that here for x squared, then what would we get here? Well, where do I have any x squareds here? Well, I've got double brackets here and double brackets here, and we've got this ax squared here. So, x times x, that would be x squared, okay? We then times that by a. So my coefficient here is simply a, okay? I've got a, a x squared there, okay? A bit of a tongue twister, so a x squared, so a. We now do the same here for c. So x times x, that would be x squared. So I've got c x squared there, so that's just plus c. And then what's my coefficient here for x squared? Well, that would be a. So what I can see then is a plus c must be equal to a. Okay, because all we've done here is equated coefficients. So this coefficient here for x squared was a. This coefficient here for x squared was c. And then this coefficient here for x squared is a. So a plus c is equal to a. However, we know the value of c. That is 5. So I've got a plus 5 is equal to a. And therefore, we can now solve for a. So therefore, a is equal to 3 because 8 minus 5 gives us 3 there. So we've done everything that we need to here pretty much. All I'm going to do now is express it in this form here, substituting the values of a, b, and c in. So let me just write this out in full. So I've got ax squared minus 9x minus 5. That's all over x minus 1 squared times x plus 2. Oops, times x plus 2 there. And that is identical then. So I've got a over x minus 1, where a is 3. So we've got 3 over x minus 1. We've then got b over x minus 1 squared. So b is minus 2, so I get minus. 2 over x minus 1 squared. Okay. And then finally, c over x plus 2, where c is 5. We get plus 5 over x plus 2 there. Okay. And then finally, if I just list the values of a, b, and c again, just underneath, so it looks a little bit neater. So therefore, a equals 3. B equals minus 2. 
and C equals five there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution there to the very last question, question four. And that brings the end of this video on exam revision for algebraic methods.